and welcome to a very special edition of The Lockdown Show, a show dedicated to positivity and motivation in these lockdown days. Before we crack on with this week's exciting episode, please take a moment and click on that subscribe button at the bottom of the screen. The Lockdown Show aims to share some tips, tricks and inspiration from various guests featured on the show to help you through the isolation period. In this week's show, I speak to international best-selling author and executive mentor, Ulrich Nerlo, about bringing your heart to work and embracing the change from working in the office to working at home. Our resident lighting cameraman, Duncan Curtis, is on hand to talk about shooting successful videos on your smartphone and how to position your camera comfortably to avoid shade. Crafter Gary Jackman shows us how to make a beautiful theme wreath that will complement any home. And finally, I'm joined by performance artiste, drag queen and international cabaret star Oliver Gregory, also known as Titi Car Car, who discusses his online shows during the lockdown period and also his recent stage performances. All this and more in the lockdown show, here's this week's positive news. <laughs> Local communities across the United Kingdom have seen an increase in the number of radio stations that are on offer for them to listen to. Volunteer-led community radio stations are popping up everywhere, giving locals the information they need for their particular area during the pandemic. Now, some community radio stations have even been granted temporary licenses to broadcast on the airwaves, which benefits local vulnerable people in the actual area who may not be active online. According to London's Mayor Sadiq Khan, cycling in the City of London could increase more now because of the pandemic. As commuters are looking for ways to socially distance from others, cycling and walking to work just makes sense. The London Street Space Initiative is a temporary cycle network which will transform town and city centres making wider pavements to allow people to socially distance and queue for shops safely. And finally, cranes in Belgium have been helping out isolated and vulnerable people in high-rise care homes by reuniting them with their loved ones. The cleaning and maintenance company Group F thought it would be a good use of its cranes whilst work was halted to help out the local communities and reunite families together. The lockdown period has seen many businesses embracing video to deliver key messages to the staff, the customers and stakeholders. Video is the perfect platform for connecting people, however, it can just as easily lose viewers' interest through doing something thoughtlessly. Now, Duncan Curtis, our resident lighting cameraman, is on hand to offer some essential tips when shooting video on your smartphone. Over the last few weeks here on The Lockdown Show, I've been speaking to Duncan Curtis, our resident lighting cameraman, who's been offering some tips and some tricks about shooting video using your smartphone and some of the common mistakes people have been making. Now, because people have been sort of uh, locked in at home, so to speak, over the quarantine period, a lot of people have been using video for meetings or to, live, to deliver their message online. So I'm delighted to welcome back to our screen the lovely Duncan Curtis, who's going to be talking to us a little bit about keeping your camera steady. Duncan, hi. Hi, Richie. Um, yeah, I thought it was probably good to uh, just go over something we basically talked about briefly a couple of weeks ago about keeping the camera steady while you're while you're filming keeping the phone steady um good thing about phone the phones these days especially the newer ones is a lot of them have a steady shot kind of built into them so you know if you're filming someone walking along the street or while you're walking it kind of gets rid of a little bit of that shape but there's still a lot that it can't cope with so while you're walking and talking the phone moves up and down quite a lot. It can't cope with a lot of movement. So it's all about kind of keeping the camera steady as you as you possibly can. I find when I'm watching videos, uh, my family videos in particular, uh, floor ceiling, floor ceiling, or walking along and it's too rocky, um, my brain can't take it and um, I end up switching off and going to the next video. This is the, always the danger. So this is not something that you want to happen. How can people stop this happening? Um, well... As we said before, the best way to keep the camera steady is to put it down. Um, so keep put it on a surface that's uh, that's not going to move, whether you're leaning it up against books or whether you're just positioning it on a tree in the park so you can stand away from it. The camera's very steady. Um, they're inexpensive. You're not spending any money on, on, on those methods of keeping it safe. Um, I guess we have um, items that we can use that cost – less than a tenner, between 10 and 20 pounds, and this is a good example of one. I've got an old old photographic tripod, uh, and on the top, this little clip that just screws onto the top of it, cost me £9.99 online, and it'll fit any size phone and any orientation, even though we already know, steer away from the, uh, from the portrait. 
People um, still do though. So yes, you can just I know pull they that do. out and fit any mo any mobile phone in there. Yes, you can, um, uh, and that way, you know, you can take that tripod to wherever you want to film, anywhere outside in the park, anywhere in the house, um, and it's automatically set for uh, for any situation. So I, that's that's what I would recommend as the top tip. And what I've been finding is, um, if you know, particularly if I'm filming events or anything like that, not that we have during the lockdown period, but if if I have and I'm holding my phone like this for a considerable amount of time and my hands start to shake what's all that about how can i stop that actually happening yeah i mean that's that's good if you're if you're filming um events where you're using the back camera so filming something away from you and you're right the longer you hold it up if you're if you need to film something for any length of time you hold it at the end of your arms then it will shake you know trying to keep your arms up like that for any length of time it's going to get painful um I, the, the, the best way method for that is to just pull your elbows into your body and then so the you're absorbing the, you're absorbing the movement a little bit like a suspension on a car exactly and it's not your entire arm you're holding out then so it's not it won't be as painful it's, it's it's the top arm of your top part of your arm is supported and you find you'll be able to hold the phone um, a lot longer uh, in, in that kind of position. So yeah, that's that's the best best method. That's not not so good for if you're filming yourself, obviously, because um, you know it'd be far too close to the camera. If you're filming selfie um, shots, and you're far too close to the camera, so you just get this part of the face. But very good for filming anything um, away from you. So filming outside, what can we use around us to sort of steady our shots? Um, yeah, I mean, if you're filming yourself outside, then anything that you can prop the camera against to keep it steady, like a brick wall um, or trees are very good. You know, if you put it in the crotch of a tree and lean it against the, the branches of a tree to keep it steady filming yourself. Um, if you're filming other things using the other side of the camera, then um, it, again, you can use the tree looking at the screen for reference so you've got the, the angle correct. But um, if you're using your arms, again, maybe a brick wall or uh, a fence or something, you can lean your arms on, again, in that sort of bent position that uh, will keep the, arm, keep the hand steady, or lean back against the wall. So, you know, it gives you an extra level of support. You're supporting your back, you're supporting the top of your arms, that'll keep the camera a lot steadier as well. And that's also a safety thing as well, isn't it? Because you know that nothing's going to come behind you. Yeah, safety is a big thing. I mean, obviously, when you're filming, you're concentrating on the screen of your phone, uh, see what shot you're getting. So you'll be less aware of what's around you, particularly if you're walking and talking at the handheld. While you're constantly looking at the screen, you don't want to bump into people, don't want to bump into other objects, injuring either themselves, yourselves or, or other people. Um, but even if you have the, um, the, the tripod attachment as well, um, that you put the tripod down, put the phone in, uh, remember that uh, you're obviously going to be standing back from that tripod to give your presentation to camera. Um, people are going to be walking along the street, so be, you've got to be very mindful of where you put that tripod so people aren't walking into it, so they're not going to get injured um, because you know you don't want any of that coming back to you. I've been filming myself before and I've been walking along uh, backwards and I've actually walked into something and nearly fallen into the road. So. Um, yeah, just be mindful about your environment. A lot of people, when they start filming, switch off. Uh, common sense goes out of the window, and they and they are all of a sudden viewing the world through the lens. You've got to remember that there are things still happening around you, and yeah. uh, you, what you don't want is to walk into the path of an oncoming traffic or fall down a cliff or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Fall in the canal, trip over something behind it, you're not able to see. Um, but it's all about the, it's also about the, the safety of your own phone as well. If you're, um, the advice I gave just now about putting your phone in the crotch of a tree or on a brick wall, be very mindful of where you're filming because you don't want some opportunist to come past and swipe, swipe the phone while you're trying to film. So health and safety is uh, top priority, I would say. Excellent. Well, some great tips from you this week, Duncan. How can we find out a little bit more about you? Uh, well, you can visit my website, sunfaceproductions.com. Uh, you find. Uh, um, brief details of what we do with testimonials and examples of my work or the uh, LinkedIn profile. Fantastic. Thanks very much. You stay safe. Until the next time. Thanks, Richie. See you soon. As we begin to ease the lockdown, many employers are going back to work as businesses open again. 
Many employers are insisting that employees still work from home. Making the transition to working from home can be a challenge for many, especially if you've never done this before. Now, in this week's episode, I talk to international best-selling author of The Life Bridge, Ulrich Nerlo, about bringing your heart to work and embracing the change. During the lockdown period, many people have faced challenges working from home. If you've never worked from home before, then balancing work and personal life can be quite difficult. Now, on a personal level, I started working from home in 2010, and I've been through the emotions, the challenges, the difficulties and distractions that comes with being based at home. Now, what can make this even trickier is if you don't really enjoy your job, working from home may make you feel like you can't escape. Now today on The Lockdown Show, I'm delighted to be joined with Ulrich Nerlo, author of international bestseller, The Life Bridge, who's going to talk to us about balancing work and personal life. So you're a people guide and we're coming out of the lockdown at the moment here in the UK and lots of people have been working from home. Now I know for a fact when I started working from home back in 2010, I actually struggled with the change of the office and then the home environment, what with all the distractions going on. Um, what can people do to actually embrace this change? Well, I mean, I think we have to distinguish between, I mean, uh, extroverts and introverts, um, because this is, has a huge impact on, on how we actually react to this. Now, the introvert person has probably had a great time working at home, not being disturbed by other people, not having had to, to reflect on what does other people think about me or what am I supposed to do and so on and so forth. Whereas the external person has been suffering much more of this. And, and, and this, I mean, this is the first time literally since the Second World War that we've been, been limited in our freedom. And, and to, in my perspective and in, in my, my experience, most people, they seek the feeling of feeling free, which is also why people are suffering severely in, in a time like this. And, 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 and I think the first step is actually to, to acknowledge the feeling that you have inside. I'm frustrated. I'm happy. I'm sad. I'm desperate and then put words into it. Because this is, this is the first step of actually the self-healing process or the inner dialogue to become much more reflective and, and relate to your feelings. A lot of people have careers they love. Um, a lot of people have jobs and careers that they actually starting to hate now. Uh, for people that are actually stuck in a rut, what advice do you give them? How can they move forward? And when do they know they've got to move forward? I came across some statistics from Gallup that showed that uh, basically it's only 13% 30, of the people coming to worry that actually bring their heart to worry. That's not the, the statistics, of course, but I mean, only 13% of the people coming to work globally are happy about what they do. 63, they don't care and the rest hate it. And in my point of view, the, the problem is not actually the people that hate coming to work, it's the 63% they, 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 they don't care. Because the result of it is that they don't bring any energy to, to, when, to the workplace. They, they don't bring any uh, emotions. They're basically just coming to work to get their paycheck, to have their uh, weekends, their holidays and stuff like that. And I think the challenge with, with this uh, this process of COVID-19 is that a lot of people have woken up and realized that they were just in a hamster wheel and that they're actually suffering emotionally. I mean, 90 to 95% of what the average person is doing, thinking and feeling is unconscious right now. And I believe that the process we are in right now is changing this dramatically. That can be a positive result if we change our mindset and work with it, but it can also become a catastrophe if we are not much more conscious about it. So there has to be a trigger point, doesn't there? Absolutely. I mean, after three weeks at home, more or less all your habits have been canceled. They've been erased. And, and, and this is the moment where people really should stop up and go into the helicopter view or take a piece of paper and ask yourself, what makes you happy? I mean, find the answer to what makes you happy and you found the answer to everything. The, the challenge is that most people, they know everything about um, what they are not happy for. Or for instance, dreams. What, is, what are your dreams? Most people know everything about the things they don't dream of. 
and, and, and this is the challenge. I mean, I, 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 I sincerely believe that what we think is what we get. So if we think positive, we get positive. If I think I don't want to become sick, I don't want to become sick, you will become sick. Whereas if you change that around and work with your mindset and really start to pay attention to your thoughts, which people actually forget to do, you're actually experiencing that um, you can change it around by saying, I want to be healthy, I want to be healthy, or I want to be happy, I want to be happy. And if you keep repeating that, things change. And, and now is the moment. This is a perfect moment actually to take the time to change your mindset. What do you mean by bringing your heart to work? One of the most important things that I was doing in the organization that I worked with was, was making people realize that they, they, they didn't bring their heart to work. And I opened up the, the ability and the, the, um, the feeling of actually bringing their heart to work. And I, I showed people the path towards the power of people connecting as people. We're running a lot of the organization based mostly on cognitive aspects, when we communicate, when we create a strategy and so on and so forth. And, and, and this, is, this is why we are lacking uh, work happiness. This is why we are challenged by people not engaged, being engaged in whatever they should do. This is why we are experiencing uh, a lot of resilience towards change. I mean, resistance to change doesn't exist. Lack of meaning is what's generating the resistance to change. And when we start to have an organization where people bring your heart to work, things become simple and things that well, you're not able to succeed with before suddenly succeeds much easier that you can actually believe. What motivated you or inspired you to actually you know, go down that route and write a book. Imagine, I mean, how many people I can work with as an individual. Imagine how many people I can reach by doing my keynote speech or interviews like this. But imagine how many people I actually could read, uh, reach if I would be writing my books. And, 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 and this, is, this, is, this is the driver of writing my books. It's, it's really to reach out to even more people and make a difference to them. And, and I mean, I've, I've uh, reached more than uh, 11,000 sold copies globally. I've been number one in five different countries. I'm getting emails from, from my readers around the world saying that, I mean, I have, I've been so lonely for the last six years. I thought I would never find my, my dream uh, boyfriend. And I read your book. I changed my mindset based on your book. And hey, I'm getting married uh, in a half a year. Or uh, a person saying, well, I hated my job. I thought I could never find my job, my dream job. Um, I read your book. I changed my mindset based on your philosophy. And, and now I'm starting on the first uh, on my dream job. So in your book, you actually talk about energy. Um, how can you tell what kind of energy is actually lifting you up or actually pulling you down? You, you have to consider energy as, as, as a resource, just like money. So you invest and you get back. But if you constantly just buy, 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 and never get anything back, you will run out of energy. And, and, and this, is, this is one of my biggest concerns for people, people being locked up, because they will realize that loads of people, they were so low on energy. And, and, and now actually that's just increasing significantly day by day for a lot of people. You got me thinking here, am I an energy sapper? Um, could I be sucking energy out of somebody else or could I be giving away my energy to someone else? Is that, how do you tell that? I have this concept that I define as energy blockades. And yes, I'm sorry, Richie, you, you could be a, I, I'm not sensing this, but <laughs> as well, I mean, sometimes I can be an energy blockade. I mean, I'm filled with energy and, and, and I did a keynote speak a year ago and I was introduced as a genuine happy guy. And, and, and I, I made a decision that I want to have a happy life. So I choose to think positively. But trust me, if my wife and kids would be here, they can definitely confirm that I'm not always happy. <laughs> and, 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 and again, I mean, when you're so energized as I am, if I have a bad day, trust me, that has a huge impact on the energy around me, for sure. Now, Again, I mean, it's, it's all about really, I mean, when is it that we stop up in life? When it hurts. I mean, we, we need to be pushed off the bike somehow. It, it really, that's the moment where we hurt. It's a, it's, it's a life crisis. We lose our job, we get divorced, or we become sick or whatever. 
and and and, and honestly, I'm I'm trying to um, to change this for people because there's no reason for us to be hurting before we stop up and become much more reflective. And, and this is what, what, what it's all about. This is why I'm, I'm working as a mentor. This is why I write my books. This is why I do my keynote speak. We really to wake up people and make them realize that when we stop up, we actually start to sense things. Um, and, and, and instead of we just go through life on autopilot, which I unfortunately see loads of people are doing. Now, energy wise, I mean, there's tons of things we can do by actually realizing what, what generates your energy. And then another thing, which is the ability to say no. In my point of view, life is pretty simple. It's about consciously saying no to things and yes to other things. I mean, a lot of people every day say yes to things where they actually, inside of themselves, are asking themselves, why am I saying, saying yes to this? I mean, I hear myself saying no, and my mouth has come out, yes, fine. That's not positive energy. And the other way around is as well. I mean, when you say, no, sorry, I can't. where well, you actually could say yes, which could have a significant impact on your life quality and on your energy. Inside the book, Orwick actually gives us some like different exercises to get involved in. Orwick, tell us a little bit about how the book works. So Richie, everything that I do when I work with people is based on my own journey. And, and when it comes to the life bridge from unconscious to conscious life, it's, it's very, it's a personal book. I mean, uh, from the first few pages, you really get inside of me and, and sense uh, what I am and who I am. So, I mean, all through the book, there's, there's I mean, examples of what I have done that have, uh, and what the results have been. But uh, in the back of the book, I mean, there's concrete exercises for, for, for people to look up uh, and look into and, and to stay focused. But the most wonderful thing is that I, I've, I mean, I, my dream about the book was to, yes, of course, to make an international bestseller, but it was much more about writing a book for the person who was uh, on, on top of his game. I mean, really on, on the peak of his life writing the book to the person who was more or less falling apart and everything in between to, to, to I mean, to young people, to, to people like you and I, well, we're young, right? Um, as well to, to the elderly. And, and fortunately, it seems like I have succeeded with that. And, and, and one of the reasons for, for I know so is that loads of people are actually taking my book every day and then they just do like this and then they read like five or 10 pages. Um, and, and, and this is what I try to do. I, I try to create a book which people can, can live with every day and get inspiration from every day to keep their focus. Because at the end of the day, it's a lot about focus. I mean, the brain is, is lazy. It just want to be, be happy driven. driven. And, 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 and when you actually are trying to change things, you need to Put your brain on, 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 on really hard work and, and this is what my book is trying to help out with. I noticed that, that you've got your own sort of like YouTube following and channel and you make some videos with your organization Unified People. Tell us a little bit more about that. So uh, thank you for asking me that question. Uh, I, I mean you see I start smiling and, and the reason for, for doing so is that this, this has been a dream for the last I don't know five or six years to to actually create what I define as movement videos. I mean, again, I'm, I'm a philanthropist. I, I mean, I dream of, of changing the, the world to something much more conscious and, and much more um, reflective. And, 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 and the video that we actually started doing so uh, was, was based first on, on the COVID-19. Um, because uh, yes, we are, a lot of people are suffering emotionally, financially, and so on and so forth. But I also see this as a huge opportunity for us as people to change things. And, and this is what we're trying to really motivate people to do so through our videos. How can people find out more information about you? YouTube is a good place to start uh, as well on, on, on unifiedpeople.com. Uh, there's loads of good information. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, our unified people are on LinkedIn, but my, me, myself, uh, uh, so search for Ulrich Nalo 
uh, and you you will will get a lot of good inspiration because we we're trying to I am I am trying to make a, a big difference to people and I constantly do uh, video posts uh, on Facebook. By the way, of course, I'm on Facebook as well. We are uh, uh, I mean all all kinds of somies to to really um, make people aware of our existence. I'll put all those details at the bottom of the screen. Um, so if you want to contact Ulrich, his details will be there, and it'll also be in the description below as well. Ulrich, you've been an absolute star. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you very much. Crafting is a great way of relieving the boredom and anxiety and can be as easy or as difficult as you want it to be. In this week's episode, our resident crafter, Gary Jackman, takes us on a nautical journey and demonstrates how to make a nautical wreath. Over the last few weeks on the Lockdown Show, I've introduced Gary Jackman, our resident crafter who's been delighting us with some of his creations. Well, this week I spoke to Gary earlier and he mentioned to me, oh, I want to create a wreath. And I thought to myself, I don't know how this is going to go because it just threw out associations with memorials, cemeteries and funerals. But Gary says different. I'm delighted to welcome to the show the wonderful, the fabulous, the glamorous Gary Jackman. Gary, hi. <laughs> How's hi, that for an intro? I don't know about glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> what have you been up to all week? I've been uh, teaching dance classes online. Oh, wow. How's that go? Because you can't really move a lot, really, can you? Yeah, well, I wasn't sceptical at first, especially um, in my um, living room. It's very, very small. Well, it's been going all right, yeah. Fantastic. So you spoke to me earlier and you said we're making wreaths. Uh, are these associated with memorials and funerals? Or what, what is a wreath? Um, so a wreath dates back um, hundreds, if not thousands of years um, to mainland Europe. People would wear them as crowns, Romans, Greeks, on their heads and also around their necks as medallions um, that would be either gold and also made with different types of um, plants that were grown in those areas. So uh, what are we exactly making today? Is this something to go on a grave? No. Um, so wreaths are very um, fashionable at the moment. Wreaths can be made, obviously, for those kind of occasions. Also weddings. They can be made just as seasonal decor inside and outside your house. You can have nautical wreaths, Christmas wreaths, autumn wreaths, children's wreaths. Maybe I, I just sold one um, a while ago that was a unicorn for um, a small child for her birthday. And what do you do? Hang them on the front door or put them anywhere? Where would you normally put them? Well, um, it depends whereabouts you live. <laughs> Around here, I would possibly put them inside the house. So you can have a lot of fun with these wreaths, can't you? Yes, you can. And they come in all shapes and sizes and, different, like I said, different kinds of stylings. So if you're spending a lot of money on a reef, depending on the area, um, <laughs> it depends on where you actually want to put it. But you can have a lot of fun with these, can't you? And this is, this is what Gary's actually going to be creating here on the screen. Absolutely wonderful. OK, um, Richie, so I've got a few several bases that you can use for reefs. They come in different shapes and sizes, obviously, depending on how small or how big your reef needs to be. The first kind of wreath that you will find on the market is a green wreath like this, the base. It usually consists of four bars, is round and held together by intersections. Not using that wreath today. And neither are we using this wreath, but I'm showing you anyway. And you can order it's these online, race. can you? Oh, yeah. You can order them online, but you can get them in many different shapes and sizes from um, a florist. Any florist will usually have to store them in. This is the wreath I am using today. It's a 16-inch wreath from, um, from one side to the other, and it's flat. There is no um, relief in this wreath. I'm also using some pegs, some wooden pegs. I'm going to be using quite a few packets of those pegs because it's a larger wreath. And they're, they're relatively cheap, aren't they? You get them in the pound shop. You can get these in most pound shops or um, cheap stores um, on the high street. They do come in multi-packs. I'm going to be painting those. So depending on what style or what theme you want your wreath to be, get some paint. I have three. I'm going to be making a nautical one. So in my nautical wreath, I'm going to be using a teal. These are the sample um, paints, by the way, because you're not going to need any more than that. I've got an ivory, and I've also got a grey. 
I'm because I'm doing a nautical theme. I've ordered online some starfish. Oh. Okay, they are ordered online. You can also buy shells and things like that from the cheap shops. So great. Um, that is all you really need. If you want to go further with a glue gun, which is not necessary, but I will be using a, a, a glue gun to help um, assemble this, and that can be finished. That will be your wreath. However, I'm also using a plaque for the middle. Depending, again, on what theme, this is a nautical theme, this is just an addition. You do not need a plaque for the middle of your thing, but I'm using it. Right, so in front of me here are some pegs that I have painted earlier. Now, this is obviously a large wreath, so I'm going to be painting a few more of these, but I've painted them the three different colours. There's the teal. There's the ivory. And there's the grey. Very nautical colours. Very nautical colours. Uh, there are 60 here, but I can tell you now that this large 16-inch base is, is going to need some more, so I will be doing that in my time. Um, I'm going to sh show you now how to attach these. I'm going to hold the wreath this way, that just purely so that the camera can pick this up. So what you're going to do is you're going to take one peg, and I'm going to, between these, slide it on the inside rung and then slide it back so that this rung here fits the eye of the actual peg. From there, I'm going to do the same with the next colour, which is the grey one. But I'm going to slide that just on the inside rung and not pull it back to the same level of where the teal one is. And then with the ivory one, I'm just going to slide it on the outside rung. Like that. So you've got three different levels of pegs now. Then I go back to the beginning with my teal peg. Slide it in. Attach it. It goes to there. Now, you'll see that it's wobbling a bit at the moment. But when it goes all the way around, it's a little bit packed in and they won't move. Um, using the glue gun also helps secure it if you want to, but it's not necessary. And once again, I go on to my next one, slide it in, and there. Once that gets all around, as you will see, um, it'll be complete, and it's going to turn out into that's, that's going to turn out into a beautiful wreath. And you will have your base of the wreath that you can leave like that, or we can decorate further. How did you get into making wreaths? I um, watched a few videos on it. From going on my trips to the States, I saw lots of wreaths that I liked, couldn't find them over in the UK. I thought, how can I recreate those? So I watched some YouTube videos, taught myself how to do that. So I put pegs all around. And I'm going to lift the whole thing up because it's actually complete, Richie. So I'm going to turn it around. Initially, what you've got is the pegs that I put all around. I've staggered them, as you've seen. Then, depending on what kind of decor you want, you stick them on wherever you want, make it look appealing, and try to always go for odd numbers. So how so, many pegs you have you got see, there in total? So how many pegs? Mm. Um, on, this, on this 16 inch one, I think I use 120. Um, pegs. Did you paint it as you went along or were you doing it, have you done like a bulk amount? I did a bulk amount. I did half the amount to see how many I had. So I did um, 60 to start with and then I ended up having another 60. But they didn't take that long and to be quite honest, I, if you see the inside of the pegs there, I've left them natural. And what about the, the centrepiece of it? Did you do that yourself or did you buy that? So I'm not going to tell you where this is from, but it is from a cheap shop on the high street that's everywhere across the UK. This was three pounds. Now, how I stuck that on, if I turn the whole thing around, you might not be able to see, but I, I play, because it's a flat wreath, I placed it on the table, I placed the circular part in the middle, and I draped the, the uh, twine over the top so it would match in line with the top and the bottom. 
I use a glue gun for this. You can use uh, different things, but as I said earlier, this middle part is optional. Many people like a wreath to not have anything in the middle, but I I uh, saw this the other day, and to be quite honest, Richie, I couldn't pass it up. It was such a bargain. How much, Gary, would one of those cost if you wanted to make one? Well, it really depends, Richie, on what you're going for. Obviously, the bigger the wreath, the more you add to it will, and obviously where you find, I'm quite a little savvy shopper, so I get things relatively uh, at discount prices. And I always try to go to stores to get loyalty cards. Always helps, that little bit of um, extra helps. Every so little helps, it always, Yeah, um, anything basically from um, 10 pounds upwards, depending on how big your wreath is. So it's fantastic having you on the show again, Gary. Are we going to get any kind of a clue as to what you're going to be making next time or is it going to be a surprise again? At this moment in time, Richie, who knows? All right, fantastic. It's great having you back. And if you want to get in contact with Gary and uh, or see any of his creations, do visit his Facebook page. The details are at the bottom of the screen. Gary, it's been an absolute, absolute delight. Enjoy the sunshine. You are more than welcome. Thank you. Ta Bye. I always Ta break out in a northern accent when I speak to Gary. It's great to see so many performers embracing social media and coming up with new show concepts to keep their fans entertained at home. Online fans devour content and can't get enough of it during the lockdown period. In this week's show, I speak with Oliver Gregory, also known as Titty Car Car, who's used the lockdown to keep his loyal fans happy and increase his online profile, bringing performances from the stage to online. Throughout the lockdown period, there have been a number of performers who've used the quarantine period to increase their online presence. From comedians, actors, singers, musicians, performance artists, etc., people have been using the technology available to build their brand and embrace social media. Now today, I'm joined with a very talented performer, Oliver Gregory who's been embraced in the online world, especially during the lockdown period, entertaining his many followers on various social networks. Now, Oliver started his performance career as a dancer. He made the move over to Blackpool, where he went to work at the infamous Funny Girls Cabaret venue and developed his alter ego, Titty Kaka. Since then, Oliver and Titty Kaka haven't looked back, performing at venues across Europe and even devised a show on board a cruise ship called Legs at Sea. Now let's welcome to the lockdown show, Oliver, and Titty Car Car. Oh, am I interrupting you, dear? Oh, it's all right, love. I've been here for about three hours already. Um, no, it's fine. Good to be had. Happy to be had. Good to see you. And that's it. Here she is. Have you got an online show today? Uh, well, today we're going to be filming some things. I've got some, you know, looks that I need to get out and some random videos that I need to throw together. So uh, we're just going to press record and see what comes out, really. That's kind of the, the process. It looks quite intense, your whole makeup and your outfit and everything. How long does it take you to do this sort of like transition period between sort of like Oliver to Titi Kaka? Well, it really depends on how good you want me to look because I've done a face in 20 minutes and it's not been too glamorous, but I've got on the stage and got the job done. Um, but now that I kind of have the time to, you know, take my time with it and I'm not on such a strenuous time confront, usually takes around an hour, an hour to 20 minutes. Um, I can really just, you know, have a figure out what I'm going to do. Do you have a, a specific look that you go for? Do you plan ahead or do you just like turn around, look at your uh, wig collection and go, actually, oh, today I fancy green, today I fancy blonde, today I fancy the Wonder Woman outfit? Yeah, for me, it's fake it till you make it. So I kind of just go from it. For me, it's very simple. Brown eye, red lip, nothing crazy. Um, but yeah, with my looks, it's whether I look at a wig and I think, oh, I'm going to be blonde today. They have more fun. And then I kind of work out my makeup around that. As you can see today, my eyebrows are slightly lighter because um, we're going to be in a blonde wig. So it does, it kind of just, you know, start from somewhere and then change it as you go along and hope for the best. So during the lockdown period, what have you been doing at home? What sort of things have you been creating in terms well, of your shows, etc.? Aside from pulling my hair apart, um, I've been creating, like, I've, on Instagram, I'm trying to do a lot more content, more daily content. Um, so I've been posting, you know, like, parody videos. There's been kind of, like, looks here and there and some tutorials of things that I've shown on YouTube. Um, so as well, that's I've kind of been having a lot more time to be able to sew costumes um, and actually i've made i've been starting to make masks for people um from let me see if i've got i've got them here somewhere 
This one, Fabric Thou Craig, it's called Quarantine, but make it fashion. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, and they are available online. I do I do need to uh, share the link, actually. But yeah. We'll so put far, it up at the end of the screen. Nice little plug there, by the that's way. That's it. Get it in while you can. <laughs> um, quarantine, while it's, uh, but make it fashion. And this lovely um, this digital pride heart. And I'll be making them into some face masks. So what's Let Them Eat Hot Dogs about? Let Them Eat Hot Dogs, it's... Um, save a life eat a sausage it's just uh, i love it <laughs> yeah it's um it was like a live show um and as i said this is on a start threw it together during the lockdown and it literally is anything from we have you know we had a horticulturist on the other week um he really put the whore in horticulture oh. um we had uh artists we had an artist from the crazy horse perform the other week and um, alana you know she does q and a's uh, story times from her past it and it really is a nice um just a nice place to kind of learn quite a lot you know of uh, different people's experiences and things yeah you're not just an online performer you've performed in various different venues give us a little bit about your sort of background that's it i did that one gig in london now that time so i'm technically international <laughs> um <laughs> No, I was, um, so yeah, I originally started in Funny Girls Blackpool, um, and then I branched out from there, I moved over to Paris, um, flew over to Paris, I was there for just over a year, I think, and um, in Paris it's incredible, complete different, you know, nightlife, and uh, absolutely crazy, worked myself to the bone, um, so then after about a year of that, I literally I needed a break, and it was from then when I went, I got a job on a cruise ship as a male dancer, um, just for a break from it all, and that was travelling around kind of the west coast of America, and we did Hawaii and Mexico. So it was nice to kind of get out, see the world. But about two weeks on, um, I was twiddling my thumbs and thinking, right, I need to get some, you know, I need to get drag going again. So that's when I kind of started the process of creating my show Legs at Sea, um, and that's where that kind of came about. And kind of being on the ship in drag, performing my show, um, you know, while sailing around Alaska and Mexico and. Uh, all these incredible places and you use lots of multimedia in those performances as well i can see from the the, the visual background everything else uh you do a yeah. bit of comedy in there as well don't you well i like to think it's comedy uh, <laughs> some people laugh whether it's at me or with me so um yeah it's very much kind of my inspiration is very much a bit bet midler you know her it's very raunchy it's quite brass and um bet midler kind of mixed with lily savage um, that's they really are kind of my inspiration with how I speak on a microphone. And is that your inspiration for the character of Titty Karkar as well, or where did you take the overall sort of inspiration from? It, I mean, it's it's kind of a process, you know. Um, from when you get in drag for the first time, and you kind of have a process of moulding yourself to kind of it reveals who you are, and you've got to get this character. Um, so for me, my inspirations are from like you know uh, Bette Midler. We have the you know hollywood starlets of the 30s like betty davis and you know joan crawford that kind of divine you know diva um glamour but at the same time it is quite sometimes it can be quite um you know lily savage-esque and even danny larue um i love i love looking back through you know all this rich history that we have and kind of trying to interpret that and incorporate that into bringing it forward because now even myself before i research not many people know you know, or have heard of, seen about um, these drag queens, original drag queens from back in the day, and, you know, Charles Pierce and them kind of that. So I really dived into a YouTube trap and kind of just watched and watched and picked up things here and there as we go, so... Were you addicted to Drag Race? Um, yes and no. It's a funny one because everyone who, you know, they say, oh, God, have you seen this? And I'm... It's really bad to admit, I've, I've not yet seen the recent season. I've, you know, watched most of them, and I love it. Um, but I'm yet to catch up on the latest season. So going back to to yourself, Oliver and Titi uh -huh. Kaka, okay? I've seen pictures of Oliver. Oliver looks like, you know, quite a cute young lad, very innocent, wouldn't say uh -huh. boo to a goose. And then we've got this vamp, Titi Kaka, who actually is a pretty scary looking at times in some of the costumes. I mean, <laughs> what are the main differences between you both? You know, I like to say with Titi Kaka, she's got champagne taste and tap water budget. Um, I mean, it really is kind of like, obviously I'm still the same person in drag. It's just kind of a heightened version. Like, as you said, when I was, as a boy, I kind of, I'm a bit more, um, you know, introvert and, 
not really speak in my mind because I can have I have that when you know I'm in drag. This is my opportunity to do that. So the difference I think when I'm in drag, we can get away with murder. You know, the, some of the things that I can say or you know in a bar or over a microphone that you know if I said as a guy, <laughs> everyone would just probably leave. But because it's this kind of exaggerated, you know, at the minute one eyelash, um, classy troller people apparently, you know, just think it's okay and it's great because it really is, you know, an exaggerated version of myself and it, you can get away with a lot more, so. So what was it like the first time you actually bought her out? Well, the first I can remember, and I have pictures actually from my first night. Were you terrified? Terrified. On Funny Girls, my first night. So with, with Funny Girls, I actually replaced, the drag queen I replaced was there for, I think, 14 years. So her part in the show was primarily, you know, a main leading role. And instead of kind of re-changing all the stuff and putting me in the back, they just whacked me in her costumes and set me straight on the stage, you know, leading these numbers first time in drag, like, you know, shaking like Bambi on ice. Um, and I was expected to kind of just step up to the game and throw in at the, at the deep end, you know. So what was it like working with Betty Legs Diamond, the infamous Betty Legs Diamond? Infamous Betty Legs Diamond was nothing but great. You know, I learned so much from working with her and just watching her every night. We did six nights a week. Um, when I wasn't on stage, I was stood at the side of the stage, you know, watching her and seeing her perform. It's about and the it attention was... to detail with her, isn't it? Because yeah, she it, just does a slight facial movement. Everybody picks up on it and is roaring on the floor. Yeah, and um, the amount of times that you know I spoke with, I was speaking with her just about general things, and she really had the understanding of controlling an audience, you know, and um, what she still does, you know, she's still doing it, and controlling an audience, and really knowing what what they look, even if it's for the such such a subtle thing, like you said, whether it's an eye roll or a you know a lip a lip flare or something. But that was definitely something that you know I was so happy to have been able to pick up and look and you know just watch and experience yeah as a performer during this lockdown period how do you intend to take your online shows further now do you do they, are they going to come to an end at the end of this lockdown period and then you're going to go back onto the stage or are you going to continue with doing more stuff online now i think it's nice because it has kind of opened up this you know end to where i wouldn't really look at making more of a profile for myself kind of on Instagram and Facebook. Now it's nice because I've had experience doing that and I do want to carry that forward. Um, and don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm missing being on a stage and I need, <laughs> I need to, you know, be able to walk around a room that's bigger than a metre squared. Um, but I do, I do think um, I do want to carry on, you know, carry it through, whether that's doing a live show a bit less often or, you know, just still putting out, um, you know, content out. So as well as being a dancer, an online performer, a, you've got your fingers in lots of pies. You mentioned at the start of the, of the interview that you're a costume designer as well. You make your face masks. Tell us a little bit more about your costume design. What inspired you and what made you want to do this? So with the, as you can see, it's Coco Costumes. And um, basically what it is, you know, I've always started making things for myself. Um, and just from the things that I made for myself, people have seen them, other drag queens, and they, you know, interested in wanting custom costumes. And this is going back, you know, five, six years. So I've kind of always done that, and there's always been people back and forth. I know I did costumes for um, Clark and the Glamour Girls in His Oro New. Um, and that's kind of it. So, like, I've kind of been doing costumes for all this time. So, um, I, you know, if people need a costume or... A headdress or anything you know I'm kind of the person that that can do that for you and how can people find out more information about you well wow very Debbie Hebr Harry that's it fresh out of crazy horse <laughs> <laughs> um the uh so more information about me if you can go on my Instagram my Instagram is at titty underscore car car my boy one is legs at sea um my website www.tittycarcar.com and I think on Facebook it's TC Coco as well. I mean, if you just search my name, I'm sure I'll come up with, you know, my um, crime shot and things like that. So I'll put yeah. all that information at the bottom of the screen. Well, it's been an absolute delight having you here on the lockdown oh, show. A delight to be had. <laughs> um, we'll, uh, no doubt we'll get you back on the show at some stage in the future. Until well, then, it. you I'm take care. Fun. And this socially is distanced if we do. Fingers we're, crossed. We're socially distancing now. It looks fantastic. Look at that. <laughs> I'm glad I spent so much time on my lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> Take care.
<laughs> you too, love. I'll see you later. Bye. Well, that's all we've got time for in this show, but don't worry, we're going to be back in a few weeks with either another lockdown show, that's if we're still locked in, and if we're out of the lockdown, then we're going to be back with a brand new show and brand new guests. Now, please do take a moment and subscribe to the channel by clicking on the link at the bottom of the screen. Now, that's it for this week. Stay well, stay healthy, and we'll see you on the next show.